Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we come together, there is much for us to rejoice in. Absolutely. First of all, I want to invite all of you to fill out the member and visitor worship card. That will be received during the uh, opening hymn this morning. And then second of all, this is a big day today because we're going to be welcoming a, a brand new sister in Christ through the waters of baptism, a Madeline Elizabeth Joy. There she is. There in the second row. She's the one in the white. There. <laughs> Although mom and dad are in white too today. So I'm the one in black. I'm Johnny Cash. <laughs>
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the strength of our ancestors, the host of this meal, the builder of the city that is to come. Amen. If we have died with Christ, we will also live with Christ. Let us confess our sin to the one who is faithful. God, our helper, we confess in many ways we have failed to live as your disciples. We have not finished what we began. We have faced with friends, but ignored strangers. We have been captivated by our possessions. Lift our burdens, gracious God. Refresh our hearts and forgive our sins. Raise us to the new life you have chosen for us. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. There is rejoicing in heaven when sinners repent. Put your trust in these promises. God will never leave you or forsake you. You who were lost have been found. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Rejoice with the angels at this good news. Amen. Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. 
from where my help where, where my help is to come. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot be moved, nor will the one who watches over you fall asleep. Behold, the keeper of Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at the right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve you from all evil and will keep your life. The Lord will watch you.
are possible. And so, Lord, move us by your spirit to move forward always with you. Now may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I like uh, the way that Luke shares with us very clearly, immediately in the first verse, what today's lesson from Professor Jesus is going to be. All right? For, for some time now, we've been getting all these different lessons and parables and stories from Jesus to help us grow into a living faith in Him, in Christ, to live in the kingdom of God. And today's lesson is about this. The need to pray always and the need to not to lose heart. And so, if I were to have just stopped right there, and we were to think, okay, Jesus, what kind of lesson is he going to give us when the topic is about praying always and, and to, to not have to really lose heart? Well, I wonder what it might be. Maybe we would think to ourselves, if, if the lesson is about praying always, uh, maybe Jesus is going to give us some instructions about how to have some kind of a spiritual retreat, maybe a, a prayer retreat over a weekend or over the course of a whole week. And in that prayer, for all, it's pray always. Maybe it'd be working on the practice of, of being able to endure being in, in, in this position for, for a long period of time. After all, what position do you take when you pray, right? Hold your hands. So we're going to pray always, you can see we're going to be doing a whole lot of this. And not only do we fold our hands, we're closing our eyes, right? And so, so how is it we pray always when we're in this, this position? It seems like it could be kind of dangerous. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Kind of dangerous. Hmm. Or maybe it's a lesson that in praying always, you don't have to actually fold your hands and close your eyes. Yeah. I, I threw that idea out there on Wednesday to the confirmation class. Mm -hmm. That's right. I said, I said, you know, you don't have to fold your hands, right? I said, you don't have to close your eyes. And we tried that out. <laughs> didn't we? You know? Um, you know, you didn't really like it. That's the feedback I got. It didn't feel right, yes? And so, you know, in light of that feedback from Wednesday, I thought, I'm not going to ask you guys to do that here at worship today. You know, I don't, don't want to shake you up too much. So, you know, it could be that Jesus is going to give us that kind of instructions, but it didn't really work out that way. Or, or the idea not to lose heart. What does it look like to not lose heart? What's Jesus going to teach us about not losing heart? Maybe he'd give us some kind of example that we could pull of, of folks that, that should have known they didn't have to lose heart no matter what the long odds and, and long circumstances would have been. You know, I've been thinking all week, you know, it might be that Jesus would take some kind of example from sports, right? It's often in sports where we feel like our team has no shot in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and then yesterday there was college football games, wasn't there? You know, right. And there, were, there was one game where, where a team was favored by 30 and a half points. <laughs> uh, the Wisconsin Badgers, right? <laughs> Who looked like an amazing team, right? And I would net wager that for their opponents, the University of Illinois Illini, I don't know, maybe the players had lost heart, but the fans had lost heart years ago. <laughs> About having had a chance to really do anything. And yet, nonetheless, I didn't play out. I know it's too soon to bring it up. And then, unfortunately, it's going to derail most of you from the lesson, right? But, 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 but you know, they're down nine points in the fourth quarter, weren't they? And they won. Illinois, one. Oh. I wonder if they lost heart. Maybe Jesus 
would teach us from that. Well, you know, what if Illinois had been down 99 points? <laughs> oh, no, we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. Is that what, is that what we should be? 999 points. Oh, we still got a chance. Come on, come on, let's yeah. Now, Jesus doesn't go into the world of sports. Um, and he doesn't talk about the newborn retreats of this. He gives a, a story for life. Um, a story we can relate to, although the circumstances may be a little bit different. I mean, we can, we can relate to it. There is, there's a story about a, a, an unjust judge, you know, a powerful figure, and, and all the power and might of the empire behind him. So you got him on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you have a widow. And you cannot, you cannot overemphasize enough just how powerless a widow was in the first century Palestine. Powerless. No power. No significance at all. And so you got this contrast of someone with great power and someone with no power. And yet, nonetheless, coming back to this unjust scoundrel of a judge day after day after day seeking justice, what did the one who was powerless, what did the one who had no shot, what happened to her? She received justice. Wow! That's a bigger upset than what happened in Champagne. Then Jesus kind of points out, if, if an unjust scoundrel, the judge is going to grant, grant justice, you know, for this widow who's persistent, how much more will God our Father, who is so just, so loving, grant us what we need as well? And so, you know, okay, that's pretty good. Let's be, be persistent in prayer. Keep on praying. You know, get pray all day, right? right, right. You know, but then, then this is this kind of this twist in the end. And I talked to several pastors this week, and they really have trouble. They, they'd like to cut off the last sentence, the, the last question. You know? Because Jesus has said, and yet, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? Will the Son of Man find faith on earth? So you got to kind of go back and take a look at what's going on. How did this widow receive justice? Is it a lesson about being someone who nags a lot, you know, and just won't stop and keeps coming and saying, come on, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some people learn that lesson and they're actually pretty good at it. But I think it's more than that. For you see, I believe in this lesson, it is a lesson not simply about being someone who is persistently nagging till they get what they want. It is about someone who is powerless, facing the powers. Someone who is powerless, receiving power. You get that? For in the end, she wasn't powerless at all. For no matter how powerless you may be on your own, whatever your circumstances, wherever you find yourself coming from, when you engage in whatever you are doing from a place of faith, with a living faith in God, when God is with you, when He is the one you live and move and have your being in, when you bring God, suddenly you who are powerless become quite powerful. And no matter what it is you face, the one who knows your needs, the one who loves you, will make sure your needs are taken care of. And that's what happened in this story. What did the persistent widow need? I bet she had all kinds of needs. Certainly all kinds of wants, I bet. But at the core was her need for justice and God would grant her justice and no scoundrel of a judge, no judge who was unjust would stop that from happening. She proceeded with God 
And when we proceed with God, no matter what it is we face, no matter what the struggle, no matter what the pain, whether we're in a season of loss and grief or a season of rejoicing, we can know this, that we can rejoice always. Nonetheless, because we are living in and among and with God. There's a great, great line. Some of you have known this. Sometimes the confirmation students use this as their, as their Bible verse that they kind of focus on. It comes from Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always, right? And again, I say rejoice. And that, that idea comes from the end of the letter, a letter written by Paul, whose situation, from anyone looking from the outside, didn't look like a situation you would rejoice in. He was in prison. He had nothing going for him in himself. Nothing at all. And he was facing very soon the very worst that life can place upon us, that the world can drag us through. Paul was facing that, yet nonetheless, he teaches those in Philippi and every single one of us in his letter to the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Well, how could that be? Well, because Paul's not living by his own devices. He's not going and living alone. He's not going out there alone. He's not facing the opposition alone. He's facing it with Christ. He is facing it drawing from the power of grace. And drawing from the power of grace, he rejoices. He rejoices always. As he is so grateful for what God has done for him through Christ. And he tells them flat out, the Philippians. He said, I, I know. I know what it's like to have little. And I know what it's like to have plenty. I have learned to be content with whatever I have. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. For I can do all things through Him. Who strengthens another very good Bible verse, if I do say so myself. The persistent widow could do all things, not because she had any power granted to her by her culture or granted to her by the empire, but because she proceeded with Christ in the power of God and she received justice. She was strengthened through that reality and you can and will be strengthened in that reality as well if you can finally come to the point to realize I can't do it on my own anymore. Our God to 
BRB and the BRC. In Jesus' name. Amen. Knowing the one whom we trust, with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all those in need. Faithful man, you will not leave us without a blessing. Wrestle with your church and renew it for the sake of the world. Preserve our life to you, so that we faithfully and persistently name you before the world in prayer. Let us pray.
Hey, but don't be like that. Yeah, whatever. Don't do that.
Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. All of you are welcome to receive the sacrament, the Holy Communion. It isn't required to be a member of our Saviors. You don't have to be a Lutheran. Instead, this is a free gift of grace for all who have been baptized in Christ. All have been claimed as children of God. All have been bestowed the Holy Spirit through the waters of baptism. This is our meal that nourishes us. That we might be strengthened to be able to do all things. What is so freely given? I am Christ. I am Christ. I am Christ.
Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of blessing, at this table we have seen you face to face. And in this gift of Christ's body and blood, our hearts have been refreshed. Send us now to shine with your goodness and bear witness to the one we have received. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Will the children come forward for the children's message? <laughs>
Oh, God. 